from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It is an honor for me to introduce Linda Berry today. She has worked as a painter, cartoonist, writer, illustrator, playwright, editor, commentator, teacher, and now professor of interdisciplinary creativity at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. How many, have you, how many of you saw the comic that she did for the book festival, great, last Sunday for the Washington Post? Wasn't that great? <laughs> In it, she makes a wonderfully funny, clever, and eloquent tribute to the cause of reading and reading freely throughout one's life. She is best known to many as the creator of Ernie Pook's Comic, which ran in weekly newspapers for nearly 30 years, and 19 books that include award-winning graphic novels. She was born near Richland Center in Wisconsin. She, her brothers, and her parents moved when she was very young to an ethnically diverse, lower middle class neighborhood in Seattle. She graduated from Evergreen State College where she studied painting and writing and also published some of her first comics in the college newspaper. Many of Barry's works feature characters in a Seattle-based family, including sister and brother Arna and Arnold Arneson and their cousins Marlis, Maybon, and Freddie Mullins. In her books and comics, Barry draws on her formative childhood and teenage years to create stories about these amazing fictional people and their world, a world that is filled with challenges and traumas, but also great humor and joy. Barry's newest book is The Freddy Stories. Please join me in welcoming Linda Barry. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, well, well, hello, everybody. I really hope I'm not in a coma just imagining this, because it's the kind of thing that I really would imagine. I'm at the, the, in Washington, D.C., at the Library of Congress books. You know, it's like the kind of thing that you sort of make up when you're in the second grade. Um, and sometimes I think wishes come true, but sometimes they, you make them in the second grade and they come true when you're 57, which is all right with me. Um, so it's an it's a honor, an honor, a huge honor to be here. And I want to talk to you a little bit today because I, I know that I'm have a, I had a slide presentation and I'm going to show some of it, but I can tell that you can't really see the slides, am I right? I mean, especially because there's not one up right now. You can definitely not see it. Well, so I always like to, because I'm nervous, and I always like to start by singing a song because I, always, I think bad singing is better than no singing at all. And I'm nervous anyway, so it's the scariest thing to do, so what the heck. So I'm going to sing a song. It's an autobiographical song. It's only one verse. The tune is Coal Miner's Daughter. But um, I'll sing it about my life, and then by the end, you'll know about me. All right, here I go. Ah. I was born a meat cutter's daughter. My mom is from the Philippines, she was a janitor. I ate TV dinners at night, I grew up by the TV light, while dad drank vodka in the basement and mom hollered. Okay, so that one part, thank you. The one part, uh, yeah, I feel a lot better now. Um, the, the one part um, in there I love saying, my mom's from the Philippines and I love seeing the confused German shepherd look on your face like, no, she doesn't look Filipino at all. And I always tell people it's because I'm a quarter Norwegian and Norwegian blood can suck the color out of anything. <laughs> it's true, if you have a shirt with a bad stain and you know somebody who's 100% Norwegian, you just bring it to them and ask them to pass their hand over it three times. Let's see, hold on. If you can see the slide, see if you can point out the one with Norwegian blood there. But So that's my, um, that's my family. I grew up... Uh, um, in a Filipino family, and uh, my grandma, who was a huge, huge influence on me and my work and the way I see the world. Um, well, this is what Tagalog sounds like. Matigasang ulo ni Linda nakopo, which means hard is the head of Linda. Oh my. 
And my grandma was a, a big influence in terms of storytelling, and I think grandmas have this very interesting role um, in, in our lives. And certainly as a cartoonist, I leaned on her, I leaned on a lot of things she told me a lot. Like one thing she told me was, you know, Linda, God has made everybody a castle. In the sky, in heaven, it's waiting for you after you are dead. It's made of gold bricks, beautiful. But every time you are bad, he takes one brick away. <laughs> and your castle is getting very small. <laughs> like that was, that was how she uh, raised us. Or another, um, another way, instead of just saying, um, you know, the kinds, of, the kinds of things that you yell at kids to, to do, the, grandma always had a story. So hers would be, you know, Linda, in the Philippines, there is a vampire. She's very scary. She's a lady. In the day, she's a dog. You will know her, though, because if you see a dog and the back legs are longer than the front legs, that is the vampire. Her name is the Asmang. And at night, she takes her legs up and she flies through the air. We're like, really? It's like, yeah, she's coming to our house. And my mom was terrified of the Aswang. She goes, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. It's just a story. And my grandma goes, yeah, it's just a story, but it is true. <laughs> And the Aswang, you know, sometimes you're watching the TV and you see the picture shaking. That's the Aswang on the antenna. And at night, she comes into the house. She comes in through a little crack in the window, and then she crawls on the ceiling. She's looking for your bedroom. She comes into your bedroom. She goes over your bed. She turns, her head can twist around. And she has a long tongue with a needle on the end. And she's lowering it into you to suck your blood because you don't pick up your clothes. <laughs> so that's, I grew up with that and, and I always think that for as hard as everything else was, having a grandma like that or having some of the teachers that I had in public high school or some of the librarians that I had, actually it was a, a matter of life and death for me and they made such a difference. So being invited here, I can't help but think about Mrs. Lassane and Mrs. Bird and um, my school librarian and all these people who gave me so much. Um, that, and one of the things I like to think about when I think about this thing that we call the arts, and I'd say comics are part of that, and um, books and theater and all these things, I think of them not so much as this big accomplishment, but as this means of transportation. And the whole reason I'm standing here is because I drew a picture, which is pretty wild, right? And the whole reason y'all are here is because you're interested in books and you're interested in what these things contain. So the last few years, my study, I've been studying a lot, trying to answer this question of what the biological function of this thing we call the arts might be. Um, so what do we call the arts? So I, uh, I, the thing I think that they all contain is a thing that I call an image. And the easiest way to explain what an image is is to show you what it feels like. So I want you to think of your first phone number, because I'm going to count to three and we're going to say our first phone number out loud together. You ready? One, two, three. PA 24435. Oh, God, that sounded good. One more time. One, two, three. PA 24435. Okay, now your phone number from three phone numbers ago. Can you feel the difference in your head? One is a spontaneous thing that, that can, I'd say contains an image, and the other is thinking, and they're two different things. Um, another, so that's one thing about an image, it's spontaneous, and it feels somehow alive. And why I like to ask people to do that is because I love people to say their first phone number, and then everybody does this afterwards. <laughs> like, what the hell is that? Social security number, first phone number. Or people who can't, I saw a couple of people who couldn't remember, and it's like. <laughs> so there's something about that first phone number, that, that contains an image, um, and it feels like that. And I'd also say that it's contained by anything, that kids also, when they're attached to an object, I'd say that also contains an image. I saw a kid at the airport who had had, you know, his mom's dragging him along, and he had had the, the original Incredible Hulk doll, but um, all he had left was the leg. The leg's all I need, man. I mean, it really was. Um, and in a, way, in a funny way, you can think about little kids who their, their blankie is reduced to nothing. Now all they have is this little scrap. That's all they need. In fact, some of you grown people still have that little scrap of blankie, or you're still mourning the fact that your mother disappeared it. And I think that that 
that urge for the arts, I, I'm coming to believe that it's, well, we'll use the term hardwired, and that it begins prior to us being able to speak. So let's go back to that idea of a kid with a, a blanket. When you think about it, that blanket really is a piece, just a piece of cloth, but it also contains something else, like a painting almost, like a, a, or a character. And so let's say, instead of a blanket, let's use uh, this, maybe we're, we're talking about a, a little kid with a bunny that they've um, loved up a lot. I love seeing the toys that have been loved for years and years. My husband calls it the patina of love, which means just everything's worn off. Um, if you say to that kid, is Bunny alive? Well, first the kid knows that you're being a jerk because you, they know you're grown and you know Bunny's not alive. Is Bunny, be, is Bunny alive? It's like, no, lady, Bunny's not alive. And you go, well, is Bunny dead? Oh, no. Don't even talk about Bunny like that. Bunny's not dead. Bunny's not alive and Bunny's not dead. Bunny's something in between. And I think that that's a clue about, about where the arts are. So I had, some, I had a friend who, whose daughter got attached to, because that's another thing, when the kids get attached to something, by the time you notice it, it's already happened. They don't get to pick what they get attached to. So I had some friends whose daughter got attached to what everyone agreed was the ugliest toy ever. It was a stuffed banana with blue eyes and little dangly arms. She called it Mr. Banana. And so she loved Mr. Banana from before she could talk. Then she's two, then she's three, now she's five, now she's six. And Mr. Banana is looking like a junkie at this point. I mean, he's just, he wasn't built for this kind of um, loving. And, um, and the parents are getting very insecure about the fact that their six-year-old is carrying around this ugly, ugly piece of cloth. And so they, they hatch a plan to get her off of Mr. Banana. And you can tell it was her, their first child and they hadn't read any child psychology books because they decided to do it while they were on vacation. <laughs> so, so they went to England and um, they convinced her that Mr. Banana wanted to stay in the hotel room while they went outside. They just totally told her that's what Mr. <laughs> Banana wanted. And she's like, you all don't even know what Mr. Banana wants. But she kind of went along with it. They left Mr. Banana in the hotel room. They go out. They have their breakfast. I'm sure they're winking at each other. like, And they get back to the hotel room. And the hotel room's been cleaned. And Mr. Banana is gone. I love, I love seeing people. People go like this. It's like, y'all don't even know Mr. Banana. You're like, no, not Mr. Banana. It's because you do know Mr. Banana. You totally know Mr. Banana. And so she starts screaming. The parents suddenly realize what has happened. They call downstairs and luckily the concierge also knew, understood Mr. Banana. And my friend said the happiest phone call he ever got was ring, ring, ring. Mr. Banana has been found. <laughs> then there's a knock on the door. And they, they're there they are with this, this thing that looked like garbage to the parents now looks like, you know, like the Holy Grail. And, um, and she runs and she's reunited with Mr. Banana and everything goes all right. What's interesting about that is Mr. Banana really is a piece of cloth that has some stuffing in it. He's also an object that makes a difference of whether that girl's going to be able to sleep that night or not. And I don't think that we as beings who have gone through um, all kinds of evolution would have something like that unless it had some kind of biological function and some function to do with survival. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. That kind of relationship doesn't end when we grow up. All of you have had a book that you've fallen in love with. You know that book when you're, you're laying in bed and you're reading and you know it's kind of too late to start a book, but now you're on page 20 and it seems like a good book? You know that feeling? And then you're on page 40 and it, it, you can tell it really is a good book. And then by page 50, you're like, don't break up with me, man. Like you don't want it. <laughs> There's something happening that's akin to falling in love. And so you, you read it over a couple days and now again, it's late. You should be asleep, but you only have about 40 pages left of that book. What do you do? Don't you slow down? Which is kind of wild, right? You slow down because this world that you've been in now is only a quarter of an inch. That's all you got left. And when you finish it, don't you do this. Don't you finish it, you finish it, and then don't you hold the book? What the hell's that? Like, you know what I mean? You hold it like, I love you. you know? <laughs> Something happened. Something happened that turned that thing from a, a bunch of paper to something that contains an image. So much so that if you lend that copy to one of your friends and they don't give it back or they lose it and they buy a new copy for you, it's not the same. What is that? 
that's the stuff that I'm um, I'm studying. That's the stuff that I'm I'm really interesting re interest. I'm really interesting about um, <laughs> interested about. Another thing about um, about an image is it's specific. Um, like when I was a kid, I always wanted an imaginary friend. Some of you were lucky enough to have one. I didn't know how to get one. What do you do? Like, you know. And um, so one day I realized I could just lie. <laughs> Who would know? Which meant I had an imaginary, imaginary friend, <laughs> which is not nearly as good as an imaginary friend. And I had a friend who, she had an imaginary friend that I could tell was real. The reason was there were some very specific things about her imaginary friend. One, her imaginary friend had a stupid name, Sprinkles. Like, you wouldn't make that up. The other thing is she could only talk to Sprinkles through a moving fan. Like, you can't make that up. So I knew her imaginary friend was real, but it was the specificness. And if... Um, so specifics part of an image, and some of you have had the experience, I think most of us have had the experience of trying to keep a journal. Remember from when you were little, you tried to keep a journal and you get that first diary? I'm 57, so the diaries they had down at the pay and save were the five-year diaries where you're supposed to write three sentences for every day for five years, and in the end you'd have I don't know what. Um, but I couldn't keep it up. And then um, I tried several journals later, and then people would, would know that I like to write, so sometimes I'd get a gift of a very expensive, has that happened to you, you know what I mean? Then you really are in trouble because you don't want to mess it up at all, but you write your name in it, it's like, oh, it's already ruined. And <laughs> I always think that in, in the afterlife, or when I, when I die, uh, um, that one of the circles of hell I'm gonna have to go through is when all my, my unfinished journals attach themselves to me, and I'm gonna have to try to walk with them. So I had a friend who found, and I was trying to figure out why it was so difficult to keep them, and I had a friend who um, found his journals from high school, and he was really excited to read them over, so you know he was over 50. And um, <laughs> he poured a big beer, and he said he started reading it, and it was just feelings, 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 no details, just feelings, feelings. And he said, Linda, it was like finding original footage of the Battle of Waterloo, but it was shot by a monkey, so there's no pictures of Napoleon, it's just bananas, 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 bananas. <laughs> so, one of the, so that's one of the things I realized about a, about a journal, it's, it, it needs to be specific. If all you did was just write about the shoes that you saw all day, you'd at least have something going on versus, I don't like Mary at work, she's bugging me. You know, 4,000 pages later, Mary is still getting on my nerves. <laughs> um, another thing about uh, an image is that it's satisfying even if it doesn't make sense to the top of the mind. Um, an example I have of that was a song by the Young Rascals that was popular when I was in junior high called Groovin'. Um, they're now the old ARP rascals, but they're still rascals. And the song went, grooving on a Sunday afternoon. And there was one line that I loved. That would be ecstasy, you and me and Leslie, grooving. And I thought, that sounded good to me, you know? I didn't know who Leslie was, but you and me and Leslie grooving. And I love how Leslie could be a boy or a girl, depending on how I was swinging that year, you know? I just love that song. Well, when I got older and I was, in, I was grown up and I'm driving my car and the car has good speakers, here comes my song. That would be ecstasy, you and me endlessly grooving. <laughs> it wasn't you and me and Leslie grooving. It was you and me endlessly grooving. Which is the better lyric? It's Leslie, right? Even if you don't know what it means, it's Leslie. And which is the first thing a, a person who was editing it would take out? Well, Leslie doesn't contribute to the arc of the story, and she ha hasn't been introduced. What about endlessly? Endlessly rhymes and makes sense. And I'd say it also completely neuters the, <laughs> neuters the song so it could never have children. Um, so, um, so a version of that, that specificness, um, one of the things I love to do uh, with kids is I can't, and I want to talk to them because it, to me they're the closest to, to functioning with this image stuff that I'm so interested in. But I've realized I can't go up to them and just go, can I discuss your transitional object with you? Um, and, and I can't go up to them at all. So what I do is I just, 
I just start to draw when I'm around kids. I'll just start to draw kind of violently and big so they'll see me. So I was sitting on an airplane. Um, Mom is here. You know how they always stick the kid in the middle seat like it doesn't matter to them or something? And then I'm on the end. Mom puts in her earbuds and is on her little device, which, by the way, we're living in a time for the first time in human history where mothers and fathers have something more compelling to look at than their child's face which is pretty wild. If you know the science behind eye contact and neurotransmitters and all this stuff, it's, it's almost a catastrophe in a certain way. Um, but so she's plugged in, and he has a sticker book, thank God. So, so he's, still, he's still alert to the world around him, so I start drawing, and he looks over, he goes, you can draw, and I said, yeah, I'm a cartoonist. And he goes, draw something. So I draw a chicken and I show it to him. He goes, you are, and I go, I know. And um, so I ask him if he wants to play this game. And it's a game that we've all played, nobody really made it up, where you scribble something and you pass it to your friend and they look at it and try to find a shape and they draw something on that and then they scribble and you do this back and forth. If you do it a few times with a kid, you'll get a story. So this kid's name was Jack and he was about eight. So uh, we did it two or three times and he went, ooh, ooh. I have a story, and you can make it into a comic strip. Like, that's what I always thought creative inspiration was like. Ooh, I have a novel. It's a trilogy. You know, it's like, the title is. Um, and he even knew the title. And I knew the dude didn't even know the story he was about to tell. He goes, the title is Chicken Attack by Jack. And I did make it into a comic strip. And this is the story verbatim. One morning, a chicken was eaten by a man. The man went to work. His stomach started to feel funny. He went to the portalette, and then he went. The chicken came out. The man was surprised. The chicken was also surprised. The chicken ran from the portalette to the construction site. They uh, put the chicken in charge, and from then on, the chicken was boss. Isn't that an oddly satisfying story? I mean, it is, right? And, you're, and, and don't you feel better after hearing Chicken Attack by Jack? <laughs> now, how that works is really fascinating to me because it doesn't make sense, but it's super, super specific. And every time I tell it, I always feel better. There's, I was talking to um, one of the volunteers here about a study that was done. I keep thinking it's Caltech, but I might be wrong, about um, the benefits of choral singing, of singing. And so what's, what scientists often do is they test professionals to try to, to, to see what's really going on. So what, they wanted to find out what happens to our stress levels in our immune system after singing. So they, they tested these professional singers. They had them give a sample of their spit and tested cortisol levels and some other immune, immune system marker prior to singing and after. And afterwards, they tested them again, and there was a measurable drop in cortisol, the stress um, hormone, and, and, and there was a marker for an immune system boost. They repeated the study in Zurich, same thing happened. Then they came to um, Appleton, Wisconsin, to Lawrence University, and did it with just people like us who just want to sing. And they, it was absolutely measurable just by singing. Immune system up, stress level down. But what was interesting is if people really got into it, they, the, 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 um, the results were profound. So that was a clue to me about this idea that this thing that we call the arts might not just have an aesthetic effect, but it might absolutely have a, a biological effect. Yeah, which is awesome. So because they're able to now see, uh, well, they have fMRIs and all these different things of, of tracking brain activity, even though they're, they're not as precise as people uh, think they might be or hope they might be, one of the things that was uh, really interesting in a study that I read about was how um, when a kid is in deep play, and by deep play I don't mean, when we're adults, we, we think play and fun are the same thing. When you're in a, if you watch kids playing, they don't look like they're having fun. They don't look like they're having a bad time, but they're very absorbed, and they fall into it like this. I was watching another mother on her device. I actually time moms and kids on their device just because it's so striking to me. So she's on her device. He's trying to get her attention. He's about six. She's not paying attention at all. She even does that thing where he's trying to get her attention, so she moves like this. Um, so he's eating his breakfast. He's eating. He picks up this piece of bacon, and before he puts it in his mouth, he goes... I'm going to eat you. 
right? And then he does the bacon voice. No, no, please don't eat me. Yes, I'm gonna eat you. And I'm watching this like, how's this gonna come out, man? You know, <laughs> we're totally engaged and he's really in that. And all of a sudden his mom stops just long enough to say, what are you doing? And he has no clue, just like, <laughs> you know? It's the same thing happened with the mom when I was getting off the plane. Um, and I talked to the mom who, of Jack, Chicken Attack by Jack, and I said, you know, he's a phenomenal storyteller. He just told me this amazing story. And I repeated the story to her, and she looked at him and said, enough with the portalettes. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like when we, when we try to make art, when we try to do something, that it's a similar problem, that we start to get... The, the, okay, we, we start to get somewhere, and all of a sudden that voice comes in, you know what I mean? Uh, and tries to fix it, fix something that's not, uh, that's not broken. So with this, this, there was a study about um, when kids are in deep play and an adults are in a state of creative concentration, and there's a signature in the brain that's nearly identical for these two states. And I thought that's another clue, because what do... This is something that my Norwegian grandma and my Filipino grandma and every grandma in the world could answer, and almost all of us can answer, which is what would happen to a kid, say that I was doing an experiment, and I'm gonna have a kid and I'm not gonna let them play at all until they're 18. They can have everything else, but they cannot play at all until they're 18. Um, what do we know about that kid by the time they're 18? They'd be crazy. There's a tacit understanding between the need for play and mental health which is really interesting, we all know that. And then at some point, we think it doesn't apply to us anymore. And um, which I think is why we're all so, in a weird way, crazy. You know, like a low grade crazy, um, like a low grade headache. Um, so if you said to a kid, okay, you can't play, but here's a photo of a kid playing, is that gonna help? How about a video? Let's watch a video of this kid playing. Is that gonna help? Live, you can sit, don't move. You can sit next to this kid and watch him play, but you can't do it. Is that gonna help? That's the state most of us are in as adults when it comes to the arts. Reading is the one thing that we get to do without feeling like we have to be an expert at it. Um, so it's another reason why I, why I love um, books so much. And it's amazing how soon we give up on the arts. I remember being in the back seat of the car, the radio's on, and I heard the announcer say, I was probably nine, if you want to be a concert pianist, you have to begin by the age of four. And I'm like, damn. <laughs> You know, if you want to be a ballerina, you have to begin by the age of three. It's like, damn. So by the time you're 12, you're already washed up. You know, you get this feeling. And you get this feeling that unless you can do something really well, you don't have the right to do it at all. Um, so the only thing, the only kind of arts that are uh, left to us are, well, the only, that um, singing is just happy birthday which sounds like the Volga Boatman, happy birthday to you. I remember when I was in mass, I knew something was wrong because the priest would come out and he'd go, lift up your hearts. <laughs> and we'd go, we've lifted them kinda to the Lord. <laughs> but there was something missing there. And um, drawing, the only drawing that's left, but it's still left is the little doodles you do when you, in that one little area on the page that you feel free, which is over on the left behind a red line where the holes are. Um, <laughs> The only sculpture is peeling the label off a beer bottle really slowly while somebody tells you about their dream, <laughs> you know? But I think that the fact that these, um, that these things are still with us um, and they're still there is a, is a clue to, I mean, wouldn't you, if, even if I said to you, you can never make a living off of it, but you can sing to your contentment or you can draw to your contentment, or write a play or write a book, but you can't make a living off of it. Wouldn't you say yes? So something's going on there. It's not just about being famous, it's about something else. Um, so, because I am, my, the slides are so bad that I'm just gonna show you that one and I'm just gonna tell you a, a couple more stories. I remember here about art and why it's so important to us. Do you remember hearing when you were a kid uh, that great art will make people burst into tears? Remember that? Around the same time you heard an opera singer could sing into a, a wine glass and blow it up with her voice? 
And, and I would go into the kitchen and hold my milk mug with nobody around and go, ah, ah, you know, or I'd try to burst into tears. Um, and uh, around the, while I was growing up, the other thing that if, if you know my work and if you hold me in any kind of esteem, I'm about to change that for you right now by telling you my favorite comic strip of all time is Family Circus. Boop, 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 boop. I love Family Circus. I adore Family Circus. I adore Family Circus so much that if I've had a couple shots of whiskey and someone tries to put down Family Circus, I'll go to jail. I'll get in a fight and, and go to jail. Um, so uh, I love Family Circus because before I could even read, it was in that circle and I could see this, that life looked pretty good to me. You know, Billy, Jeffy, Dolly, PJ, you know, the dead grandparents looking down on Billy, and, you know, when he was mailing a letter like, oh, we love you. And, I mean, I just loved um, their life. Anyway, um, as I got older and I went, to, I went to Europe and I was trying to find a painting that would make me burst into tears and I wanted it to happen with a cute dude like nearby who would go, she is so sensitive, I must have her. Um, it didn't even have to be a dude. It didn't even have to be a person really. It could have been a ficus plant going, I must have her. But, um, so I, was try, I would try, and I remember being in the Uffizi Gallery looking at this Botticelli painting that had just been cleaned. It was in a room by itself. It was a La Primavera, and I'm staring at it. Cute dude right here, 9 o'clock. So I'm like trying really hard to cry. And I'm able to bust out one tear, but it's on the wrong side of my face. You know, so I'm like, you know, it didn't work out. He didn't see my sensitivity. Um, so years later, um, now when the, the alternative cartoonists like me are now kind of included in the big family of cartoonists, and I went to this cartooning convention where I got to see all the big cartoonists. Like I saw the guy who drew Beetle Bailey drew, um, walks by, you know, and all these cartoonists are walking by, and then Kathy walks by. And when I saw her, I went insane because she's really thin and really beautiful, and I thought, you've been making money off of women with asses like mine for your, you know, I'll kill you. Um, and then, and then somebody said, you like Family Circus, right? And I said, yeah, well, Bill Keen was the author of Family Circus. Now Jeff, Jeffy, from Family Circus, now he draws the strip. So they said, this is Jeff Keen. And I went, ah! like, I burst into tears. It was nothing that would make anyone want to kiss me. I was like snot and drooling. And I, and I was walking toward him like this. Ugh! And he's backing away, right? Like, like this has never, ever, ever happened to him in his life. He was totally scared, you know? And then I, I, I said, oh, just, just give me a minute. I just need to, I need to get myself together. And like, I basically squatted behind like something like that. I go, just keep it together, keep it together, keep it together. But every time I saw him, I'd burst into tears so much that it became the, the, the joke of the conference to try to just get him into my peripheral vision. <laughs> but when I met him and I shook his hand, I realized that I had gone through the circle. That circle that I had looked through the whole time I was a kid and dreamed of that life. I crossed it and I did it by drawing a picture. And so when I think about images and I think about their power, um, that it's so much bigger than, I mean, it's really the, the difference between the feeling that life is worth living or not living. And it doesn't have to be a whole lot of worth living. It can be just a little tiny bit. Okay, so let's see if there's anything else and then I'm gonna, sh I, I might read you, I'll just read you a couple comic strips really uh, fast. Oh yeah, no, I'm gonna tell you really quick about, this is, this is the, the whole point. Um, this is the whole point. So I got really interested in, in science because, I, because that's, where it, that's where you're led, kind of anyway, but I'm um, trying to figure out what the, uh, what the function of the images might be. And I um, happened upon some work by a uh, neuro, uh, neuroscientist, you probably m you may have even heard of him, V.S. Ramachandran, who's a very interesting neuroscientist, and um, his his interest is in um, the phenomenon of phantom limb pain. So you all know what phantom limb pain is, right? You're missing your hand, but it still feels like there. I think there's phantom limb pleasure, but we'll never know about it. Because like, who's gonna call the doctor? Doctor, my missing hand feels fantastic. I mean, it's like, <laughs> we'll never know. But uh, we know about phantom limb pain. 
Anyway, R Ramachandran had, a, had a, a patient who had, in fact, was missing his hand. You can see this guy on YouTube if you want to uh, see him because it's pretty amazing. He was missing his hand. But his sensation was not only was his hand there, but it was clenched in a really tight fist. And it kept getting tighter and tighter and tighter. So imagine living with that for three weeks, a year. It's eight years. And it really did erode his feeling that life was worth living. What do we do for the guy? Well, Ramachandran had this amazing idea, and he built a box. I always think of it as a big shoe box with a mirror down the middle and a hole on this side. And he had the guy put his hand in that hole and make a fist and look down. And what the guy saw was his hand reflected, right? You follow me? Then Ramachandran said, open your hand. And he looked at it, and he saw the other hand open, and it instantly started to change what was happening with his hand. In fact, that, uh, that mirror therapy is now used for stroke. It's now used for a lot of different things that they're somehow just seeing an image. And when I heard that, because I think science gives us the metaphors we need to understand art, just like art gives us the metaphors we need to understand science. When I heard that, I thought that's what images do, that in everybody's life, no matter how family circus your life is, um, that there are things that are like that, like maybe your mom died when you were little, or maybe your house caught on fire, or maybe there was a war, or maybe you're just sen too sensitive. I would imagine there are a lot of people in this tent that were too sensitive as a kid. We gather together without even knowing how we find each other, but we're all here. Um, and I believe that there are certain things that the only way that we can open that phantom limb pain, that phantom problem, is by having our experience reflected somehow. Whether it's in a book or a song, if you can remember being in junior high school, how songs, you would become addicted to them and they would change your life. Do you know what I'm talking about? There is actually some science to that, that um, we do become addicted to songs and that, there's, that there are certain songs, when, especially when you see junior high school kids and high school kids that have to play a song over and over and over again, what's happening is that the song causes a release of dopamine um, a neurotransmitter that also is released when we smoke and, um, and certain antidepressants use um, dopamine. But here's what's really interesting. It doesn't, it's not for the whole song. It's just for that one part. You know that you play the whole song and then there's that one part and you're with your friend and you point to the radio and they go, yeah. That's actually causing a, a chemical release in your brain um, if you're attached to it. So when you think about all this stuff, then it gets interesting again. Then making work using images isn't just about uh, making something great or making something that's terrible, but it could be making something that's making life worth living. So I'm going to now finish. Wait, I'm going to read one comic strip. How's it going? There it is. So even if you can't um, see it, I'm going to read you a uh, one of my characters. Okay, so this is called Titles of Poems We Can Never Turn In. <laughs> Uses of Poetry, Unit 2. We can say things in a poem that we can't say in real life. Write some examples of something you've been unable to say and use them as titles for poems. <laughs> poetry titles by Marlis. One. Mrs. Davis, the big mole on your eyelid is disturbing. <laughs> Two, please obey me. Three, I hate this pukey meatloaf, so abolish it. Four, to see the nude bosoms of Janet Jimmers and to want to see them again, for educational only. Five, every single swear. Six, Sir, I want your donut, or madam. <laughs> Seven, I want to stare hard at your defect. <laughs> Eight, mom, I have worms. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to end with my party trick that I ha have basically retired, but this is a special occasion, so I can sing without moving my lips, um, and I'm going to do it for you, and it takes a year off my life every time I do it, but it's worth it. It takes two off of yours if you watch. Okay, and this is the song from the image part of me to the image part of you, and I mean it with all of my heart. Okay, one second.
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.